Open Your Eyes is brought to you by the Belize Bank, our country, your bank, and Smart, bringing people together. Welcome to Open Your Eyes. Start your morning right. I'm Marlene Cuellar. And I'm Asana Cayetano. And thank you for joining us this Monday morning. A rather wet Monday morning That's to start the right. week off with. Very <laughs> wet, a little bit cool. Um, it's feeling like the rainy season now, I gotta mm -hmm. say that much. And uh, yeah, but we got to kick start the week. If you're a little slow in waking up because you love the sound of the rain on the roof, you're probably late already. Get up, <laughs> get moving, get the kids dressed and fed, and uh, get the ball rolling. As we said, Go there ahead. will be traffic, so you gotta, you know, get the ball rolling indeed. You do want to take that into consideration <laughs> and be considerate. There's some puddles around in the city mm -hmm. as well, so if you are driving, keep in mind that pedestrians are trying to get yep. to work too, and uh, give them some time to pass and don't splash them as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People take time to get dressed in the morning, iron their uniforms yeah. or whatever it is that they're going to wear to step out with. And so you got to be mindful, as you said, that there are pedestrians. Yeah. And it's, a, it's always a bad thing when you see someone going to school or going to work yeah. and there's a motorist who just flies past and hits the puddle and yeah. you know, people get wet. Yeah, I hate when I see it. Yeah. I mean, because you can see a puddle and yeah. you're, you just have to think <laughs> there are people possibly standing next mm -hmm. to it. Um, so do take that into consideration, but we promise to uh, provide to you a great show today with lots of information. Uh, we do have a reminder, of course, tomorrow is the big day. Yes, indeed it is. Yeah. And then we're going to be inviting you guys tomorrow night to come on out to the base so that you are part of the first audience mm -hmm. for KTV Latino for this season. That's right. So the show starts at 8.30 tomorrow night. It's going to be at the Bliss. And uh, you can get tickets at our usual outlets here at Channel 5 on Coney Drive, 88 Shopping Center on Central American Boulevard, and Smart's downtown office on Albert Street. Uh, get your tickets early so you guarantee, guarantee yourself a seat. And uh, we do have some guest performers tonight in addition to the, uh, the people who will make it to the stage. The first, uh, the season one winner, mm -hmm. Ishmael Chakun, will be on stage. I know he is loved by many. Uh, so if you have been wanting to see him perform live, tonight is the night to do so. Go on out. They're great door prizes and just be a part of the energy if you've been anticipating this show make it a point to at least go out to one of the live shows and i'd suggest the premiere i'll say this as well marlene there are fans of ktv latino who are in some of the more uh far away areas mm -hmm. out district yeah i know that you won't be able to make it but you can always tune in at 8 30 tomorrow night of course. and uh, be a part of the home audience. Yeah. Right? And if you can't uh, sit in front of your television, of course, you can watch it live on Facebook. It's going to be streaming on KTV Latino's page. So you have to find it, like it, follow it, and you'll get the notification when we go live. And you can watch it uh, on your tablet, your mobile, your computer, whichever one is easier for you. But don't miss it. It starts tomorrow night at 8 30. Right? All right. And uh, now we got our birthday shout out for today. Let's see who we're seeing. Compleanos <laughs> too. We are saying happy birthday to Yvonne Cod. That's right. Good morning, Yvonne. Yes. Happy birthday from all of us here at Channel 5. There she is. And open your and eyes. Open eyes yes. And uh, we do want to tell you uh, that we hope you have a great day. Do enjoy it. And uh, we hope everyone is extra nice and treat you very special today. And remember, if you'd like to give a special shout out, you just have to contact us here at Open Your Eyes. Uh, send us a Facebook message, send us an email or drop by the office and let us know. All right, we're going to be checking in on our weather for today. And we have Michael Gentle on the line. Good morning. Yes, good morning. How are you today? Yeah, I'm doing good. All right, you're staying dry. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we uh, we've had a pretty rainy day, or uh, 24 hours, I should say. Uh, what are we expecting for today? Okay. Um, we still get some moisture and instability over the area, mm -hmm. uh, and we're expecting um, skies to be cloudy with sunny breaks today, mm -hmm. and cloudy at times tonight. We can expect isolated showers and thunderstorms mostly over inland areas this afternoon. And then a few showers and thunderstorms will occur mostly over southern and some coastal areas. Tonight. For, for tomorrow, Tuesday and Tuesday night, we should see a break in uh, the moisture, generally fair conditions with only isolated okay. showers or isolated thunderstorms developing. Okay. And is there anything specific affecting our weather at this time? Uh, we have a uh, broad area of low pressure over the <coughs> Northwest Caribbean and uh, Central America. So we're basically having light winds. And um, with daytime heating, we get some activity develop over inland areas and then swing towards the coast. At night? At night, yeah. Okay. All right. And so uh, what about the winds for today? The winds will be variable at 5 to 10 knots. Sea conditions will be slight. Mm -hmm. And our high temperatures? Okay, we're expecting about 87 along the coast, 93 inland and 84 in the hills. For tonight, 78 along the coast, 73 inland and 68 at the high elevations at the mountain pan ridge. Mm -hmm. And you said tomorrow we should be getting a break from some of the showers? Yeah, we should see isolated activity, isolated showers or isolated thunderstorms. And uh, we are still in the hurricane season, the peak for our area. Is there anything we need to be monitoring at this time? Yeah, we are looking at um, a developing area, a non-tropical area between Bermuda and the Azores, but it has a medium chance of becoming a tropical or subtropical storm um, the next couple of days and is expected to drift back towards the west. Okay, so we'll keep an eye on that one? Yes, we will. All right. Well, thank you very much for that update. Okay, you're welcome. You have a great day today. Same to you. All right. There you have it. Another uh, rainy day. It'll be off and on, though. Mm -hmm. We might have some sun peeping out. And uh, you can definitely uh, expect some showers uh, in your area sometime during the course of the day. It's good news for farmers, if nothing else, mm -hmm. that there is some rainfall to be expected amidst what has been a rather dry rainy season, Marlene. I know, I know. And, and any time I'm tempted to complain about the rain, I remind myself how long we've been going without it. Yep. So we must appreciate it uh, for what it is. Uh, we know it's helping out with the New River situation. It's mm -hmm. helping out with the farmers affected by the drought. And I think just all around, you know, the grounds really needed some, yeah. some water to soak The earth in. has been thirsting. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Yes. All right. Well, it is a uh, Monday morning, and so it is time for us to shift gears into Eye on the News. So there have been interesting developments in the court uh, since Friday, mm -hmm. where we were following closely two particular cases that one was before the Supreme Court and the other was at the magistrate level. Mm -hmm. I know many Belizeans saw the headlines on Friday evening where Justice Courtney Abel had ruled in favor of former city administrator Candice Miller. Yeah. They were also following closely what was taking place in respect of a legal challenger or a case brought by the ground commander of the People's United Party. Mm -hmm. And this has to do with where persons are registered, more particularly the Deputy Commissioner of Police, Edward Broster. So I'll look at those two mm -hmm. uh, cases individually, just to be able to provide some context for viewers who may not be fully in the know of what has transpired. In the case of Candice Miller, one would recall that this matter arose immediately upon the assumption of office by the current Belize City Council, mm -hmm. led by Mayor Bernard Wagner. 
and in the immediate aftermath of the 2018 municipal elections where the People's United Party swept all the seats and took over North Front Street at the time. Candice Miller was one of those individuals who got caught up in that transition, if I may, mm -hmm. for want of a better description, where her job as city administrator, one, she had been suspended. Mm -hmm. At the end of the suspension, she was then terminated. And the charge was that there was gross dereliction of duty on her part, uh, especially where it concerns a million dollar payout to Belize Waste Control. And as I said, she was subsequently relieved of that post. She was terminated and she then sought legal action against the Belize City Council. And you would recall, Marlene, that there was mediation. Mm -hmm. This was at a time when mediation was all the craze, right? Yeah. And so there was court ordered sit down between both parties to arrive at an mm -hmm. amicable solution. And I recall um, having tried to sit in or hover around the courts if I may mm -hmm. for one of these mediation sessions and one of the specific rules is that you cannot divulge what is being discussed or what yeah. agreements are arrived during these sessions yeah. so for the most part the the media wasn't fully aware of what was taking place had they agreed on something that is workable for both parties yeah. um, ultimately we saw that the thing went to court yeah and so closely for the past several days and last week, we have been following what was taking place before Justice Abel. Yeah. Um, in the end, it was ruled that Attorney Anthony Sylvester, who represents Belize City Council and the mayor, was not able to prove that there was in fact dereliction of duty on the part of the city administrator. And remember, there was a suit and a counter suit. Yes. The initial suit was for half a million dollars on the part of the former city administrator and the counter suit was for a million dollars which would have represented the amount that had to be paid out to uh, BWC mm -hmm. as what they call as a result of the dereliction of duty. Yeah. What is a very key thing to, to look at here Marlene and I think perhaps it, it flew over some people's heads. There was a contract extension mm -hmm. prior to mm -hmm. the previous administration the meeting office ahead of the, the municipal elections last year. Yeah. And while it may be arguable that it may have been illegal, it certainly was in the eyes of some unethical that you would extend someone's uh, contract, notwithstanding the fact that your tenure in office expires at a certain time prior to the elections. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the, the areas that was being looked at carefully there. Um, my understanding is that similar to how there is a, a mayor's association, there's also a city administrator's association. Yeah. And so this was one of the, the, the points that was being clamored for, that they want some kind of uh, security of tenure, if yes. I may. All right, so all of these are, are ingredients in what took place on Friday. Um, some people, Marlene, some of the folks that I spoke to, just for a matter of public opinion, were saying to me that perhaps the Belize City Council moved too hastily in light of the fact that there is a contract in place and that contract should have been reviewed or honored as opposed to just summarily relieving this individual of the post. And at the heart of it, taxpayers' monies. Mm -hmm. That is what is going to be used to pay off this contract. Yeah. Right? So it's an interesting thing. Oh, it's very uh, interesting. And I think it, it ties back even into, into another picture. I think mm -hmm. the idea of, of going to court for wrongful termination, yeah. I think is sometimes, sometimes people are hesitant mm -hmm. um, to follow through uh, with that. And uh, here we have one area where, um, or one case, for example, where uh, the previous city administrator fought hard. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I believe in her exit interview, she talked about just feeling vindicated yeah. because she kept on saying that she did not 
um, derelict on her duties. It is a very interesting case. I think uh, the contract that you're talking about that was signed under the previous mayor, Mary Daryl Bradley, um, was one that he was questioned about mm -hmm. extensively as well um, and defended uh, despite what uh, other people may have thought. Mm -hmm. And so when the new council came in, they, uh, uh, Ms. Miller, as a city administrator, mm -hmm. was already there on contract and we're not quite sure. We'd heard rumblings of perhaps, you know, not getting along. It, it is yeah. a new council. It is mm -hmm. an a pre employee of a previous uh, council and a council from a different party as well. Mm -hmm. um, but the court has ruled. Now it's to see what will happen from here, if they will appeal the case or what will um, be the... Pr we didn't get a precise number for the judgment. I there wasn't a dollar amount. Yeah. There are speculations that, as to what that may be. Yeah. Um, some people say it's in the area of $380,000 or so. Mm -hmm. I know that insofar as the conclusion of the matter on Friday, yeah. both parties, the lawyers for both parties were once again before the, the judge to try to determine what that figure would have been. Yeah. Um, I'd like to say this while we're on that topic, Marlene. Perhaps it's customary mm -hmm. or it's one way of thinking that when a new administration assumes office they bring in their own people yeah and so maybe it was one of those situations where while now we do have a new city administrator that r has replaced yeah. candice miller perhaps the thought at the moment was we'll bring in our own person to, to oversee the affairs of belize city yeah. and well, that kind of time is when you have a contract in place, mm -hmm. that definitely stymies you from being able to bring in yeah. your own person to, to yeah. manage the day-to-day -day affairs there. You know, I think in the larger picture, this takes me back uh, to what is always a, a debate for some about mm -hmm. um, in the ministries, uh, mm -hmm. whether a CEO or permanent yeah. secretary was yeah. the best example, um, was, the, was the best way to move forward. The thing is that the two schools of thoughts and mm -hmm. I think it's, it's up to people to decide which one is better. You can come into an office and want to uh, appoint mm -hmm. or delegate uh, kind of your, your CEO position, your second in command or, or manager of the office position mm -hmm. to someone you trust, someone you know will be able to execute your, way, your work the way you want. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, these are public systems and yeah. so it is a comfort for many to think of a seasoned public officer mm -hmm. being in a post who knows how things run and knows how things should run, despite very often the inexperience of the elected official. Yeah. And I mean, we know Belize moved from permanent secretary to, to CEO, CEO a while back. Mm -hmm. The city administrator, while it wasn't necessarily an appointed position, uh, I believe it was just a change with each administration. Mm -hmm. What that contract did was kind of take it back to what a permanent secretary mm -hmm. used to be before. Mm -hmm. um, and clearly it didn't work out with uh, this city council. And we are here at this point with this court case. But it is an interesting conversation to have. And as I've said, I've, I've had this conversation with people and they're always two schools of thoughts. And if somebody believes in having an appointed um, second in command, they, they're firm in that position. And then there's some who believe in having a seasoned professional maintaining continuity mm -hmm. in the post. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the best way to put it, Marlene, yeah. in terms of looking at it from that point of view. Yeah. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see what the final figure was, yeah. because we left Friday with that still being worked out. Yeah. So it's something that we'll follow to see what was agreed upon in the very end in terms of the payout to uh, Ms. Miller, and of course, whether there will be an appeal to the outcome of yeah. this matter. Yeah. So the second issue that was before the courts, again, it was a case that we were also following closely in last week yeah. and this had to do with um, two challenges that were brought before the lower courts. One in which uh, Paul Ferguson took the stand mm -hmm. and the other in which uh, Marconi Leal uh, also is set to take the stand. Mm -hmm. Now this has to do with what was initially broken on social media, I'll, I'll, I'll give the credit where it, where mm -hmm. it belongs, right? Documents were, were displayed on Facebook where the address of the Deputy Commissioner of Police, uh, Edward Braster, was given as number one Kelly Street. 
And so when persons looked closer, they realized that number one, Kelly Street, is actually the location of Chonsan Palace Restaurant, which belongs to proprietor Lee Mark Chang. Mm -hmm. And so some people were immediately up in arms to say, well, look, this man doesn't live at 1 Kelly Street as this document says he does. He lives elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And it brought to the fore the issue of uh, voter registration and how that process works. Mm -hmm. Now, the truth of the matter is that for anyone who wants to challenge this thing legally, the threshold or the burden of proof is fairly high. Mm -hmm based on the way how the law is written to the protect the voter. The person who brings the complaint yes. has to prove it. Yes. And so Paul Ferguson, we all know him as Chicken Dread, was made to take the stand and under cross-examination by attorney Urson Ellington. Mm -hmm. He was unable to, 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 to prove that uh, DCP Broster doesn't in fact live at number one Kelly Street. Mm -hmm. And so while the matter adjourned in the early part of the, the case in the morning, by afternoon, the case was withdrawn yeah. because I think the threshold was too high for him to, yeah. to successfully prove otherwise. And it's the same fate that befell the case that was brought by Marconi Leal. I understand um, 50 or so cases were withdrawn and he's proceeding with six yeah. uh, that will be tested before the courts on October 15th. Yeah. Now that is one to look forward to. Again, as I mentioned, these cases are pretty much difficult to prove. Yeah, you, right. and, and I appreciate that you said that. In fact, I'm recalling an interview um, that we saw in the news uh, with Honorable Kari Musso said mm -hmm. that he felt that it wasn't going to go anywhere, but yeah. they were going to go through it on either principle. way. Mm -hmm. And if you couple that with what the Prime Minister said last week as well in an interview talking about this kind of shenanigans will mm -hmm. always be a, a part of, or politics, um, it, it, it's sad. <laughs> um, you know, the thing is, the re-registration exercise, because it had not been done for so mm -hmm. long, uh, the purpose behind it, people always, uh, and, and we wanna believe very often in this idealistic um, notion that things can be fixed and people mm -hmm. will follow through and everybody's doing their job. Uh, but clearly, we are all cynics and cynics for a reason, because mm -hmm. here we see now where houses have 30 people registered yeah. in one home, which is impossible. In a two-bedroom two house. Yeah, which is <laughs> impossible. And, yeah. and, you know, you don't see that type of traffic passing through nonetheless. Mm -hmm. And so their responsibility is several places. While it cannot be proven, it is known that the practice mm -hmm. is done, particularly by the politician or mm -hmm. the, uh, the, cro the, the associates of mm -hmm. the politicians in order to get more voters in their area to sway them mm -hmm. in one, one direction. It is also, I think, a disappointment uh, from the Elections and Boundaries Department. And while they have a ginormous task in vetting mm -hmm. these um, persons, who, the, the voters who register, we still hope that they're doing so effectively and some things that seem like such a clear and obvious um, discrepancy mm -hmm. somehow wasn't caught. And so I think that when we see these things, it continues to build on the cynicism that we have in the systems that do exist. Are we ever going to have a fully transparent, uh, no-nonsense uh, type of system? Probably not. I think that is what the Prime Minister is alluding to. But what we want to hear is that we're trying and that we will uh, be as, as, as stringent as possible to minimize it rather than just saying, so it'll be. Marlene, when I look at this particular case, three things come to mind. Mm -hmm. uh, the issues of re-registration, redistricting, and the overall issue of what is known as gerrymandering. Mm -hmm. When you look at the build up towards November 2020, yeah. there's already political activity taking place. Mm. Um, some folks are already in the midst of mobilizing their people and what have you. And so there will always be movement of voters. Yeah. Um, I know that ahead of the ICJ referendum, there was the re-registration exercise, yeah. but the current administration has been wary, to say the least, in terms of 
carrying through the redistricting exercise. Yeah. And so all of these, what we're seeing are results of, of this system not being put in place and being followed through effectively. Yeah. So those are some of the issues that carry forward this week in terms of coverage of stories taking place in and around the country. So we conclude our eye on the news with that. And it's time for us to get moving into our show for today. And we have three wonderful conversations lined up. The first is an update from the Ministry of Health in regards to the dengue outbreak. Mm -hmm. Dengue is still very much in and around the country. So we'll be discussing what the latest figures are and what you can do to protect yourself. And the second part of our show, we're going to be having a conversation about security. We've been hearing many stories about home mm -hmm. invasions, um, some very brazen, brazen ones at that. And so we're going to have some representatives from Four Point talk to us about how you can try to protect yourself uh, within your home. And our third and final conversation this morning is uh, biodiversity and finance. Mm -hmm. It's called Biofin. We will be joined by several individuals to discuss what's the latest with Biofin initiative. All right. So that's uh, what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to go ahead and take a break and we will be back in a few. So stay tuned. For 100 years of service excellence in Belize, the Belize Bank Limited
we are back and we're moving into our first conversation for this morning. We are still on dengue alert and we're going to be getting uh, an update from the Ministry of Health uh, about this issue. We're joined by Dr. Marvin Manzanera, the Director of Health Services for the Ministry of Health. Good morning. Morning and thanks for the invitation. Good morning. So with the rains coming in, uh, clearly I think the, the issue of dengue um, becomes an even more prominent issue for those of us uh, who are experiencing those mosquito bites. Uh, Dr. Manzanero, this is a global issue, the outbreak of dengue. Put it into perspective for us. Yeah, well, it, it is a global issue and it is being pegged to um, climate change and any pattern that is going to arise as a result of that. You mentioned the rains and we are expecting that uh, perhaps the number of cases would increase. But that's going to be, I, I think it's, it's a debatable issue as to what's really going to happen in that regard because even though we didn't have any real rains in the past two, three months, we did have um, numbers that were much more higher than the anticipated or usual numbers over the last five, six, seven years. Yeah. Um, so we peaked maybe about three or four weeks ago in total number of cases per week, but that those numbers can go up, as you have rightly said, with the rains yeah. about to come upon us. In terms of the uh, association with climate change, what, what is the conclusion being drawn there? Well, in previous years, we had noticed that dengue would follow the rainy season. Mm -hmm. So it mm -hmm. means that whenever the rains would increase, you would have that increase across. But that cycle wasn't respected this year. Mm -hmm. But then for March, we had been alerted that we were not going to have an additional dengue situation in that we were headed in for a drought situation, but that we were expecting a dengue outbreak. So we basically, as a ministry of health, tried to prepare for March. Um, we worked in tandem with communities to start to do clean campaigns in June, July. Um, so I think that is the first issue you can peg to climate change because it didn't respect mm -hmm. the rainy season pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, and there have been studies where you can actually link rainy season and the actual number of dengue cases in Belize as well. Uh, but that didn't happen this year. So I think that it's going to be unpredictable as we go along. Um, or dengue is also cyclical and also um, with urban expansion, dengue is an uh, urban disease because the more persons you have, um, the more likely it is that you're going to have more cases. And also because of the characteristics of the mosquitoes that also evolve in, in that situation. Mm -hmm. When you look at the current figures against previous years, is there a particular trend that we're noticing? No, I mean, we, by May, I think we had more cases mm -hmm. than we had had for the previous year, um, for the entire year. Um, ah. And we are, what, three quarters of the year, and our numbers mm -hmm. are more than 2,000, I think, is, is, is the total number of cases that we have had. So um, in the first few months before the rainy season even started, we had more cases of dengue than the entire year before. Yeah, and mm -hmm. then in June, July is when we started to see the escalating numbers yeah. mm -hmm. and more people being hospitalized. And you are aware of the three dengue-related deaths. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we say dengue-related because the patients had dengue and that seemed to have propelled um, and caused even eventually their demise. But um, uh, not fully confirmed, but they are mm -hmm. dengue yeah. cases as such. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I started off by saying that this is uh, a global issue. Yeah, I think the numbers I saw this morning, there were uh, about over 2 million cases report of dengue uh, cases reported globally. Um, and uh, particular countries are experiencing record numbers. The Philippines and especially the countries in uh, Central America right around us. What I find interesting though is also the number of deaths. And, and that's kind of where I wanted to go. We have taken dengue um, for granted a bit in Belize, we, we, we think that you'll get the severe fever and the pain and then you'll recover. Uh, but we do have to be more cautious, right? Well, two things here. The thing is, you can have dengue and just have one day of fever. Mm -hmm. And you would not know that you had dengue. You might be thinking you're coming down with the flu. Mm -hmm. And then a severe case is going to be usually a reinfection, which means you get dengue a second time. Mm -hmm. So most people, are, when they get their second case of dengue, they are not really going to be aware uh, of that they had had dengue before. Yeah. Mm. What we have seen this time around, though, is that um, cases progress much more quickly, which means people start with fever, and within two or three days, they are very, very ill. Mm -hmm. um, not so sure why that is happening. 
Yeah. Uh, so we take dengue for granted because it's usually just fever and, and back pain and, and, and severe uh, um, bone pain. But every patient is different as well. Mm -hmm. If you have any underlying disease, then that's more likely that you're going to have complications as a result of that. Uh, people who are very young, pediatric populations, like you said, in Honduras, two thirds of the deaths in yeah. Honduras are in pediatric populations. Under 15. Under 15. Yeah. Um, and in Belize, also older folks need to, to everywhere need to be aware of their diabetic high blood pressure. Uh, we also tend to auto medicate, which means patients would usually want to take naproxen, aspirin, um, diclofenac, um, things that they buy. Over the, uh, counter. over the counter or sometimes even even over the counter illegal because it's mm -hmm. not supposed to be sold some of the items and that can make your case much more complicated um, so people usually come late into the disease um, for example I believe the last patient came in and within 24 hours she had um, she she died at, at Carl Huchner. so so it's it's part of that that process is taking it for granted and also not seeking prompt medical attention. Uh, that, that those can be the, uh, the determinants in, in, in the actual outcome. Because the symptoms of the regular flu and dengue are so similar, how does one then differentiate? Because I wouldn't go running to the hospital if I figure it's just a flu. So how do I then say, you know what, let me go and check this out because it may not just be a regular flu, it may be something else. Okay, the thing is, as we always tell patients, once you start to have fever, mm -hmm. because of what we are, the situation we are in, you, can, you should only be taking Tylenol mm -hmm. or paracetamol, acetaminophen. Tylenol is the brand name and any of those things that have acetaminophen and paracetamol in the first 24 or 48 hours. If after 48 hours your fever is not getting any better, you start having um, abdominal pain, mm -hmm. unusual fatigue. Those are the, the cardinal symptoms. People mm -hmm. are just fatigued, fatigued, fatigued. Um, unusual lower back pain, severe um, joint uh, muscle pain. Then you need to go and seek medical attention. Yeah. And we had a particular situation in the Dangrika area, Southern Health Region, where we had an increasing amount of patients being hospitalized. 20 plus in a given day for a space of 10 days wow. where we had to use um, cots because we had overwhelmed our mm -hmm. bed capacity. The cots that are used for emergency situations by NEMO, those were uh, lent out to us so that we could have used them. Um, so it's whenever you're having those symptoms and it should be the doctor that makes the decision as to whether you should stay inside the hospital to be hydrated because it, there is no specific treatment yeah. or whether you can be managed at home. So here's another question then. Are there two types of dengue we're looking at? Is there dengue and then dengue hemorrhagic? No, the, the, the classification mm -hmm. was used as such because also people anticipate that you need to have bleeding mm -hmm. for you to reach yeah. a hospital. That's not, dengue hemorrhagic fever mm -hmm. is no longer used in the classification. Okay. It's severe dengue um, because people are not necessarily going to bleed. I mean, mm -hmm. the people who died are not necessarily bleeding. It's usually just a severe loss of fluids, mm -hmm. which is what which part of the treatment initially is hydration. Um, so people actually uh, die because of severe loss of fluids, severe mm -hmm. dehydration. Yeah. Um, liquids just start to um, go to all other um, abdomen, other cavities, lungs. Um, so it's not, it doesn't have to be hemorrhagic yeah. um, dengue as such. But you need to have had a previous bout of dengue before you can have um, severe dengue because mm -hmm. it's usually your body's reaction to that first viral, in yeah. that, that's what causes that severe body reaction. So to be clear, what you're saying is most likely if you get severe dengue, it's because you've been exposed to dengue before, yeah. but you may have been exposed to dengue and not know it. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. I could have had a one day bad yeah. feeling and not know that I actually fought off the first bout of dengue. Which is from a personal standpoint, which is what happened when I had severe mm -hmm. dengue. Yeah. I mean, I did not know mm -hmm. I had, had dengue before. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought up your personal experience because that's also one of the things I think people don't recognize that we looked at the deaths and, and there are three and I think any loss of life or preventable disease is, is worrisome. But there are also a lot of hospitalizations and long-term care that people um, may require from severe dengue. Yeah, we have had, I mean, even colleagues at work have mm -hmm. three weeks to recover just because they're saying I'm just too weak. Um, mm -hmm. Not saying that you don't go back to work, but it's people are just not up to where yeah. they're supposed to be. 
Uh, it can be up to three months. People are still having uh, muscle Contribution. ache, their weakness mm -hmm. and stuff. Yeah. Um, and it, as I, as I said, depends on every person and the under underlying disease that you may have. That's what can prolong the recovery process. Yeah. In terms of vector control, what is the public health department doing? I know, I know, it's an extensive undertaking to go around and spray and, mm -hmm. and advise or encourage people to to get rid of any water receptacles that are stagnant but what is the department doing in terms of proactively addressing this matter you know that's a very tricky situation because i think the common issue that gets flagged um, mm -hmm. to us on us particularly on social media is you are not spraying enough mm -hmm. um, but spraying is not going to be the ultimate situation I yeah. mean, uh, that's part of your vector control strategy but you see, it's, it becomes complicated because we are a growing population. I mm -hmm. mean, you have, we are, I mean, we are sparsely populated as well when you compare it to other. So you have many communities that are so far spread out that it makes it difficult for you uh, to go and spray every single mm -hmm. street, every single community across the country. Um, and it's done by cycles as well. You, if it's raining, you also can't be doing mm -hmm. um, spraying because, I mean, the rains are going to bring down the whatever you're spraying yeah. around. Uh, mm. So it does, doesn't really help. Um, so the challenge has been, I think, getting everybody involved. It's cleaning up the breeding sites. Mm -hmm. That is a much more effective strategy because if you are expecting us to just come and spray, and I, I can tell you that Vector Control Department has been hiring staff. We have been applying for funds for people to go and do even door to door spraying in some of the more affected communities. Yeah. But the interesting thing is you go and you spray the house, but it's full of breeding site so mm -hmm. people know the breeding site is there but the expectation is that somebody needs to come and spray my house and that is going to resolve the problem and that's not really um, the situation which is why we took a more proactive approach and started inviting communities to start to do cleanup campaigns um, mm -hmm. not everybody latched onto it i can tell you there are some village councils that simply just Perfect. There's no clean, interest. Clean up no like interest. garbage clean up I mean, we know the old tires we know um like Buckets pots and, and buckets like and people mm. who are collecting water but you know sometimes they're vulnerable thing things that may be making us vulnerable in our um, home and we don't recognize it what are some of the other um, things that we need to do in our homes coconut shells mm -hmm. egg shells mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, I mean they're the more common even the flower pots because we yeah. found those mm -hmm. those um, you know the flower pots that have the, uh, the flower pot and then it's a little plastic container around it uh, we found out those were um, part of, of, of the problem um, mm. because it was a drought situation as well people would be placing collecting water, water collecting mm -hmm. water whenever it rained and so it was more likely that you had more stagnant water yeah. mm -hmm. in a given uh, period so it's really any place uh, and that's also part of the vector ecology the, mm -hmm. the mosquitoes are finding more and more breeding sites because they are evolving yeah um, so, so that's part of the of the situation that we have to deal with I, I think I read that even a bottle cup that's holding yeah. Yeah. water can it, any yeah breed yeah. mosquitoes yeah. yeah it can be the plastic or even the metal one mm -hmm. yeah. yeah any bottle anything that can hold water even if it's a one two drops of water that is enough for the yeah. the mosquito will lay say it's just when the water mm -hmm. comes about this one so mm. from what I'm hearing from you there are a couple of things one you're, you're trying to get out with the spray, the, the vector control, as much as possible. Um, but that is kind of a temporary fix. That will only manage the mosquitoes that are out. What you want to do is prevent the mosquito breeding situation. That's the idea. Okay. That's one. Uh, the other thing is prevent further infection. Okay. Because also the situation is if somebody has dengue at home, then that person needs to be protected in terms of using, if possible, insect repellent sleeping on mm -hmm. that bed net um, because you wa don't want the mosquitoes to be biting you any further to pass on the infection uh, to others mm -hmm. which is what happened uh, in Honduras once the case study was uh, studied a little bit further because you found out that people who had dengue were given days of work mm -hmm. so people instead of staying at home whatever travel long distances exposing themselves to other vectors and that's how it was so they were going to work with dengue or going to other places mm -hmm. when they were given time off from work for on, on, on sick so leave the more mosquitoes bite them get it the, spread. the mm -hmm. dengue and spread yeah. it's even more so 
if you do get dengue, if you get a sudden fever, pain behind the eyes or pain in your joints, you're advising people to go to a doctor or a clinic, first and foremost. Yeah, that, that's the idea, right? especially if you have a chronic disease. I mean, if you are a diabetic, high blood pressure, HIV, um, using antibiotics, steroids, mm -hmm. major surges, or if you're in the younger population, pediatric population, which on the five older populations, pregnant women, um, those are the persons that you ideally want to screen first. Yeah. And the doctor should determine whether you need to be hospitalized, whether you can be managed at home, because that's also a factor. If there's a patient that you know is going to adhere to, uh, to stay home, take bed rest, be hydrated, as opposed to somebody who's not really going to, mm -hmm. to stick to whatever um, information you can give them, then you rather keep them in the hospital yeah. uh, rather than send them home. Um, so it's detecting it early because you can give a specific treatment and managing it dir directly. Um, and I think that's part of what we have done. Yeah. We have trained um, so far four people. We sent them outside. Three went to Nicaragua. One went to Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so they were training, trainer of trainers. Mm -hmm. So they are coming back. They have come back to Belize and they are all doing training at each regional hospital and that training will continue over the next couple on of weeks. On how to manage the, the outbreak. Clinical management. So we have first, if you have the signs, go to the hospital. Secondly, um, if you're given time off from work, take it. You don't want to be moving around and... and Bed rest, yeah. hydration. Okay. Uh, the other thing is prevent the spread of it. So you want to protect the infected person um, with a mosquito net. People in the house will want to use repellent. And the person who has dengue should also be using repellent yeah. so that he doesn't get bitten by other mosquitoes. Okay. Another very important thing that you mentioned was not to use um, any aspirin or any aspirin product. Any of, any of those der derivatives from Ace that same acetaminophen, family. Acetaminophen, right? Acetaminophen is the only one you should use. Should okay. take, yeah. Acetaminophen, paracetamol. Okay, those are the so ones. we don't always know what that is. We know, we, <laughs> we know the, the brand name. So what, what ingredient do we need to look for um, to know if it's okay to take? Acetaminophen, paracetamol, those okay. are the ingredients. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you More commonly known kind of as, as Tylenol, Tylenol okay. but we are not sponsored by Bayer, so I we know. shouldn't be using that yeah. name, but um, that's the more traditional name that you would find. That people would use. Okay. Do not take aspirin. That's, that's the yeah, most important. Yeah, and, and then you have the diclofen, naproxen, the common ibuprofen. Mm -hmm. uh, those should not be used um, in the management of dengue. Because Unless it it's prescribed by a doctor, because it mm -hmm. could be that you can use it, but we are telling people not to use it because it can complicate your situation. Okay. And can you explain to us just why uh, the, the cases of dengue are getting so severe so fast? Um, as I said, we are not so sure why that has happened because Belize is not the only country that's reporting rapid progression. Yeah. Um, I do know that just at the end of last week, and that's data we just got and we haven't published it yet, uh, we, got, we do zero types. I mean, there's four different zero types of dengue, mm -hmm. if you would. And the ones that are circulating in Belize are one and two. Uh, there's one, two, three, four, that's, yes. that's mm -hmm. the numbers. Um, some countries are reporting two and three, but neighboring Mexico, um, Quintana Roo, which is still mm -hmm. in the outbreak um, phase as well, is reporting the same ones that we have, zero type so one So what is two. one and two? Can you describe? Uh, well, they are just the zero types of, of mm -hmm. the virus. Um, mm -hmm. You need to have been exposed to one, I, whichever one of the four, mm -hmm. and usually when you get a different serotype infection is when you mm -hmm. get a more severe case. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's dynamics because the Caribbean countries are reporting two and three much more commonly being circulating. Mm -hmm. Around we are reporting one, well we got a report, 60% of the ones we did serotype were type one, and the remaining, sorry, 70% were type one, and 30% were type two. Mm -hmm. But it really doesn't, clinically, that really doesn't make a difference. It's yeah. for us, epidemiologically, not going to Yeah, you are not going to have any difference. Yeah. Uh, you are not going to be able to detect it also with a simple test here that yeah. has to be sent outside. You know, when you when you pay attention to what's happening in the rest of the region, if you look at Honduras, if you look at Nicaragua, or El Salvador, it seems very scary. I mean, I think Honduras has over a hundred deaths related yes, to Yes, about 170. Dengue. Dengue. Mm -hmm. And some of them are having, as I said before, record-breaking uh, number of, of dengue infections. And it leads me to, to be concerned of our situation here in Belize. Do you think that we've seen the worst of it? 
um, well, we should be having patients dying of dengue. That, that, that's one. So one person dying is, 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 is it shouldn't happen. I mean, it, it, yeah. it's, it's, it's too much. And we have not really had dengue-related deaths in as far back as I can recall. I mean, I, I don't wow. recall any, any probably so 10 years. So three is record-breaking for us then? Uh, yeah, it would, we would have to go back to data, but at least 10 yeah. years, I think I had not seen or recall any yeah. dengue-related deaths. That, that's one. Um, it can get worse, yes, with, with the rains coming on board if we don't make an extra effort or we, d we let our guard down. But yeah. understand this is a community social effort that needs to happen mm -hmm. because we at Ministry of Health are going to be receiving the end, the end of, of whatever has happened because it's patients whenever they are already infected and very ill that they are coming to us. And that shouldn't be the case. What you want to do is prevent any further infection from, from happening. But before that, you even have to talk about the prevention of or elimination of breeding sites. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier that uh, the state of Quintana Roo is in the outbreak stage. Where are we by comparison? Well, our numbers have started to go down. Um, mm -hmm. I think um, the numbers from the week, not the week, not the week one, but the week before, because we haven't tabulated the numbers for the week mm -hmm. on by. Uh, was the lowest number in the last five or six weeks. Mm -hmm. So we, our highest number was hit about four, five weeks ago when mm -hmm. we had more than 200 cases in, in one week. Mm -hmm. So and it's of essentially course on a decline? Well, it has started to decline, but mm -hmm. we didn't have any rain mm -hmm. three, four weeks ago, so which that's, yeah. that's one. And understand also that these are, because people also say, oh, but that's, you are not giving us the real numbers. I know much more people. Yeah, but these are the people that are, showing up in the system yeah mm -hmm. you have a vast amount of patients perhaps that are never going to make it yeah because as you said they might have fever one or two days and that's it yeah. or people say oh my family member has dengue they went to the hospital i'm saying this because we see communities we have families of eight nine ten people where one person was taken diagnosed with dengue mm -hmm. come back comes back infects everybody else but, but those other nine don't go clinic. i mean yeah. so those numbers mm -hmm. will never appear in the system um, so the 3,901 is the total number we have had this year up to uh, These are 10 days. clinical cases, right? Clinical and laboratory, laboratory. because also once we have the, we know where we are in the outbreak phase, mm -hmm. we don't screen anybody. We don't screen everybody then. So you're saying you used to test for it before and then when it became uh, common enough, you stopped and kind of the doctor is looking at the symptoms clinical. and saying. Mm -hmm. But you may still get a blood test because okay. for example the ones that we went sent on to Trinidad for serotyping were done uh, in people who we know we had yeah. dengue. I mean we just wanted to find out what type of dengue they had. Now as, as you said before there are people who are particularly prone and if you look at what's happening around us we got to be concerned about the children too. Do you think that we should be taking extra precaution like uh, repellent on a daily basis? Should we adapt our own behavior to to prevent getting dengue where possible i think even wearing long sleeves i mean yeah. i am particularly very paranoid about mosquitoes now so yeah. um we are not also some traditionally we don't use insect repellents so that's something that people don't really latch on to mm -hmm. it's just like we don't use sunscreens yeah yeah and 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 those things are things that i think should be part of of, of the changes we we need to because you're not going to eliminate all, or you might have a clean environment, but wherever you go to work, yeah. or wherever you have to traverse, or in on your way to work, yeah. uh, you you might become um, um, yeah. exposed. So you try to minimize your risk. Yes. Yeah. Now, the most important point that I hear from you is that because of the rapid progression, it's probably best that at the start of the fever you go to the clinic or a doctor. Is yeah. that what you're saying? Especially if you have any of the predisposing conditions that can make it um, a worse case for, for mm -hmm. a worse case of, of um, dengue mm -hmm. I mean diabetics older persons um, I think in the last particular case a patient had sickle cell anemia uh. um, as the underlying cause and I believe there were some other yeah. uh, complications in the other two cases as well so, so this <coughs> to go back to what you were saying initially if you have a pre-existing condition perhaps in the case of the individual who had sickle cell anemia, catching dengue only exacerbates what that situation is? If you don't have it properly controlled. I yeah. mean, if you're a diabetic and your sugar is high, then you have two factors 
yeah. to deal with now. The body's uh, working uh, extra hard there. Yeah. So you might be dehydrated from before you got dengue, and the dengue can just make your situation worse, so you're as an example. So yeah. you're looking at diabetes, hypertension, some of the common things that people... People who are on antibiotics, people mm -hmm. who are on steroids, um, uh, lupus patients, um, sickle cell anemia, I mean, there's many conditions. That and I pregnant women, that's a pregnant key woman, one, yeah. um, Yes, because pregnant women are more likely to become much more dehydrated, much more quicker. Yeah. I believe one of the cases that died is also a postpartum. Yeah. Two of the case, patients, I think, were postpartum. Yeah. Not immediate postpartum, but they had had a pregnancy-related situation yeah. before. All right. So we're hoping that people are, are paying attention. Um, is there anything else that the public can do to help to uh, keep or new infection cases on the decline? Well, one is also, I think, trying to educate ourselves as to how to prevent dengue personally. And I think a community effort, I, I mean, it can't be just relying on many shuffle to come around mm -hmm. um, and, and do the spraying. As I said, we try to latch on to communities as spearhead cleanup campaigns, which is not necessarily something that we should be spearheading, but we had to. And we started from March, uh, I know, up to August, September, there were still cleanup campaigns being spearheaded by municipal staff. And we had simply people who chose to not participate. That still happens. There are communities yeah. that just did not accept uh, or did not spearhead it. And we can't go and do the cleanup campaign in a specific community. We're overwhelmed by that. So I think it's a work, um, a community effort that is required. Yeah. So the invitation will continue to be there. Um, and also, the expectation is not also to wait for the numbers. I mean, the numbers are until they have gotten to a certain point. It's yeah. trying to prevent everything. So just try not to get bite by killing the mosquitoes and preventing your own... Eliminating breeding yeah. sites. Yeah, all right. Thank you very much for coming in and providing us with the latest update. Thank you for all the invitation. Right. We're going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we talked about preventing dengue. We're going to try to uh, prevent invasions in our homes. That's a conversation after the break. Please stay tuned. Over 100 years of service excellence in Belize, the Belize Bank Limited recognizes the importance of leading the way.
and welcome back to the second segment of our show this morning we're switching gears we're going to be discussing uh, preventing burglaries and home invasion and I know that has been on the rise recently. We have with us on set this morning, James Wolverson. He is the operations manager for Fort Point Security. Good morning. Good morning to you all. Good morning, everyone. We also have Simeon Avila. He's a chief security officer. Good morning, Good Mr. Morning, Avila. Sir. Good morning, gentlemen. So we've seen what appears to be an increase in the number of breakings recently. And most people are wondering, well, what can I do to protect myself or protect my property? Where does one begin from? There's an old proverb, um, it takes a village to raise a child. I'm sure mm -hmm. you've heard it before. Mm -hmm. um, the same can be applied in security in many ways. It takes the entire community to keep the community safe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of general knowledge out there that normally we do know, but we're not reminded of. For mm -hmm. example, um, where you live, what precinct does it report to in the police department? Mm -hmm. Not everywhere in the city goes to the same police department. Mm -hmm. Um, do you know what precinct you live in? Mm -hmm. You know, do you know the number of the police precinct? I mean, it's easy to dial 911. Yeah. Um, do you have any friends in the police department? Do you know the direct number for the fire department, for example, the mm -hmm. hospitals? Um, mm -hmm. Wow. Little, little things like that are, 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 are good knowledge to have. You I know. think quite a few people fail that checklist. Yeah. Right away. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Sure. And so it, it's, it's kind of that preventative thought that you're thinking of. We don't think of a fire. Um, everyone thinks we'll call 911, and mm -hmm. that is one option, but it's easy to get to the place closer to you. Mm -hmm. That's what you're saying. Security and crime are share one similarity. They're both mm -hmm. very proactive industries. You have to be proactive in what you're doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the security is definitely no different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, simple things like driving home at night. Um, how many of you actually take the time to check your rear view mirror to see if yeah. anyone's following you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How many times do you change your route home? Mm -hmm. Just to say, let's do a di let's take a different route home tonight. So if anybody's following me or, or trying to figure out my patterns, mm -hmm. throw a wrench yeah. in the gear, you know, mm -hmm. change it up a bit. Now, security is your game. This is this is your forte. So you can th uh, pretty much, I think, go into an area and assess immediately the threats that exist from whether people are taking a conscious look at their threats to what type of threats exist in their environment, right? Um, Tell me, you know, when you walk into, let's say, a house and, and they're looking for a, a beefed up security, how do, how do you identify where the threats are? What are some of the things they need to start looking at? Well, I mean, there's, there's various, various things. Your security requirements aren't going to be the same as my security mm -hmm. okay. requirements. Everybody's circumstances are different from the area where you live to, to what material your house is built of, the outlay of your yard. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's various, various factors. Okay. Um, there, there, there are certain rules that apply generally for everyone. For example, if you live in a yard that has no lights and your neighbor has a lots of lights, who do you mm -hmm. think is going to be broken into first? You mm -hmm. know, True. if your yard has a lot of high bushes and my yard doesn't, mm -hmm. whose yard is going to be broken into first? Mm -hmm. um, there are certain fence, factors. not fence. Fence, no fence. Um, dog, no dog. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, are you a lone, uh, uh, isolated person? Do people come and visit you? Do you go and visit people? Do you talk to your neighbors? Do you even mm -hmm. know your neighbor's name? Mm -hmm. If your neighbor went away for the weekend, would you know? Mm -hmm. If your neighbor was away and you heard loud noises next door, what would you do? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Indeed, these are some of the, the circumstances or factors that are often take for, taken for granted. Many times you find that you have persons who move into a community don't really make much of an effort to really get to know who their neighbors are or who the yeah. persons are in the general neighborhood. It doesn't even have to be the person next door. It could be a face that you constantly see coming in and out of your particular neighborhood. It's the same, I would want to say, for um, persons who have elderly people living with them as well. Most times people go to work or they go away on their, their, their own thing and they leave behind someone who's seemingly defenseless. And you wouldn't know that because that person doesn't come out of the house much or you're not introduced to who those persons are if they're living next door. Are these some of the factors that one should be looking at as well? Uh, I mean, of course, um, you know, when you, when you have an elderly person at home by themselves or, or small children mm -hmm. or a single mom or a single woman or whatever like that, um, 
you know, you have, I mean, things cost money. To have a security guard at your house 24 mm -hmm. hours a day yeah. costs. And not all of us, or not everyone, excuse me, has the budget to afford that. Mm -hmm. However, you do have things like um, alarm systems, camera systems, mm -hmm. um, which are handy. For me, critical when you have systems like that is to have someone monitoring the system. Yeah. So if you live in the bush and your alarm goes off, who's going to respond? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have some neighbors, you don't know your neighbors, they hear the so sound, the first thing they're thinking, Christ, I hope Kaitano hurry up and turn that mm -hmm. thing off so I could go back to sleep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No one's really taking that extra step to think yeah. something could be yeah. going wrong at your house. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where I'm concerned. I think what we see more and more with the recent cases is that some of the traditional forms of protection, mm -hmm. um, there seems to be a, a total uh, disregard um, burglar bars are being wrenched off, you know, aluminum windows are being pried open, uh, dogs are killed or disregarded, um, you know, you used to think before if you're in an upper flat you don't have to worry, but that's just not the case. Um, so, so how do you go about ensuring that you do enough to keep yourself safe that you can even fall asleep at night because if you think of all the invasion the home invasions or the burglaries that have been taking place it's it's very worrisome yeah you want to um, chime yeah, in yeah, yeah, Simeon? Yeah. i think that home invasion is everybody business mm -hmm. yeah because we find out that um when there's a home invasion the um they they they, they co it comes natural mm -hmm. you know the mm -hmm. people who know you those are the um, people who commit home invasion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so we should be careful also careful about our surroundings. Yeah. Um, what is happening now? Of there are more the people who per, um, um, commit this offense. They are more advanced. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it is like what Mr. Um, James said earlier. We will need to get acquainted with our neighbors. We yeah. will need to put in the correct type of cameras um, mm -hmm. so that um, we can monitor what is going on in the area. Mm -hmm. So it, it is. It is. Uh, it is something that we must monitor on a daily basis so that we could get abreast of what is happening. Um, mm -hmm. you, you'll also find that um, the police department actually um, are very helpful. You mm -hmm. have a gentleman like ACP Brent Hamilton mm -hmm. who will take the time out um, to come and speak to groups. Mm -hmm. I, was, I recently participated in a meeting with him with a group of families that were forming a neighborhood watch, mm -hmm. um, which is an excellent idea. Communication, yeah. communication, mm -hmm. communication. And they do this through simple a WhatsApp group. Yeah. Um, I know there's a lot of people out there that are maybe shy or try and stay away from social groups as, as such. Mm -hmm. yeah. But as I said to that group that I spoke to there, if the four of us or the six of us were in a WhatsApp group for the next 10 years and Mr. Caetano never said anything in that group, and after 10 years one morning he added to the WhatsApp group, James, there's somebody in your backyard. I mean, th those 10 years of silence for me was worth it right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because the one time you decided to add was something meaningful. Meaningful. Yeah. You understand? Actionable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So people out there that get opportunities to join WhatsApp groups and think, I don't want to have to talk to these people. Don't. D but just be there and make use of mm -hmm. the communication yeah. that's being shared. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, and um, the neighborhood watch will work out too. Because yeah. we also has that, have that in the area. And we, we, know, we need to know our neighbors. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, it helps. And, and I like what I'm saying that the the police department will need to get them more involved, work with them so that um, we could have that communication. Mm -hmm. And I and I should think that um, we'll have less less home invasion in our area. Because usually they scout the yep, area, yep, yep, right? Yep, yep. And so that's where maybe your neighbor can help. Your yep. neighbor can say, "I saw this person mm -hmm. pass a couple times." Um, and what is is that? How do you identify a person who's who has strange behavior in an area. Well, it would be a strange person, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a strange vehicle. Mm -hmm. You understand? And th these are the people that circle your area. They check and see if you have any cameras, if you have any dogs. Yeah. Um, they, they, they look around to see your witnesses. Mm -hmm. And so they, that's when they make their move. When you look at living in a particular area in Belize City, for instance, right? And you look at some of the measures or the steps that you can take to secure your property. I'm thinking, okay, if I build a fence, perhaps that's a start, but people do scale fences, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I get a pair of dogs. Perhaps a dog can serve as an outdoor alarm, so to speak. Even if the dog doesn't attack and bite, it can bark and wake you up, wake you up or pique your attention. 
you're also thinking okay perhaps burglar bar windows and grill doors are you thinking um putting an alarm system on your doors with sensors and what have you but increasingly as you have mentioned thieves are beginning to get more and more sophisticated they are aware of all of these measures but being yeah. taken and i'm thinking perhaps as an end result or the last resort should i say would be to apply for a firearm license but in some cases you're not fortunate enough to even get to your firearm if indeed you have a weapon in the house that you would want to protect yourself with if there's an intrusion are there any other perhaps courses or anything available for persons to learn how to either defend themselves in a situation like that or to, to ultimately be able to secure themselves and their properties oh, um let me explain something here. Mm -hmm. Home invasion mostly co uh, are mostly committed by someone, somebody will know. Mm -hmm. Because they spot the areas and they look around in the area. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll find that they go and then they come back. Mm -hmm. You know, because they say what they want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, most of the time, if you notice how most of our Belizean live, we always confine, confine ourselves because we lock up. Mm -hmm. yeah. house because of the same reason mm -hmm. um, but that's something we'll have to look on and try to avoid mm -hmm. living good with our, with our neighbors yeah. because I think that that have a lot to do with home invasion sometimes yeah. because it could also be a setup yeah it could also be a setup that your neighbor do this and they do that and then they send the guys and they do what they got for them Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But again, that's something we'll have to look at and try to see how we could avoid all these things from happening. Mm -hmm. hmm. So, s getting involved in a neighborhood watch group. He, he also spoke of getting a firearm. You know, I always feel that sometimes a firearm may make you more of a target. Mm -hmm. It's all yeah. circumstantial. Yeah. It's yeah. All, it really is all circumstantial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, thing is about a weapon nowadays too is it can actually make you the target. Yeah. yeah actually that's why we want to rob this young lady mm -hmm. and yeah. we notice we notice that she's not very attentive mm -hmm. we know she has a weapon in her purse you know let's just wait for the right opportunity to spring mm -hmm. get her firearm and ride off into the sunset it happens yeah. happens quite mm -hmm. a lot you know what's the number one thing if you do a security threat assessment what's like the, one of the number one things that you see people doing that you would just really want to tell them stop that they're putting their own selves at risk a, a lack of doing nothing mm -hmm. what does that mean that they're not doing anything they're not trying to protect no. themselves yeah. um, and again you know belize has for so long been such a peaceful place for mm -hmm. us growing up we're all in the same age group. Yeah. you yeah. know we could walk anywhere in the night and and really for the most part not have to worry about yeah. being robbed or burgled or anything yeah, things, complacent, no? things, mm -hmm. things are really changed and we and i think a lot of it is that we take for granted Mm -hmm. but it won't happen to us say, oh, okay it's never happened in this neighborhood before yeah. and things like that and, and again i just go back to it's really all about taking a proactive attitude mm -hmm. um security companies including four point security take the time out to come out and offer assessments yeah. um yeah. you know how can we improve security of your compound we suggest you do this and not mm -hmm. everything we suggest are things that you have to buy from us it's mm -hmm. things that you have to do on your own mm -hmm. improve lighting i, I say I, i'm going to say the same things over and over improve That's lighting right clearing your yard, making sure your fence doesn't have any gaps. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned burglar bars. Um, burglar bars are another deterrent. They're great, but if you're going to put the cheapest burglar bars on your window or People have the cheapest labor guy yeah. put the burglar bars in, I mean, you could rip them off, you mm -hmm. know. So it's good to spend the money, but spend the money wisely. Yeah. And, and, and just to, to, to add to that is, you know, security systems. It's great having an alarm system. It's great having a camera system. But as I said before, it's even better to have someone monitoring them. Yeah, you don't want to catch the burglar. You want to prevent it. Yeah. That, yes. That's what the cameras do sometimes. Yes, I mean, we offer services like panic buttons as well. So if mm. you're a single mom or, an, or you're leaving your elderly behind, your mm. children behind, that panic button is a big difference. You see something out of the ordinary, press it, sends a signal to the office, mm -hmm. people are responding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so tell me, yeah, so clearly, yeah, as much as we have to evolve as citizens in, in um, under these circumstances, I'm sure as a security firm, you also have to evolve because the, the, the 
profile of the criminals have changed. Mm -hmm. Once upon a time, if there was a camera set up, people wouldn't go there. Now they go without masks and they don't care. Um, if, and as we said before, all the other things, the burglar bars, the lights, people no longer um, use these as deterrents in some cases. So even for you, you've had to evolve. Tell me about some of the ways that you've done so. I mean, you raise a great point, which kind of takes me back to what I was saying. It's all good to invest money in, in electronic security, but yeah. if you're buying the cheapest thing out there, you, you pay for what you get in many mm -hmm. cases. Yeah. And so, for example, if I walk into a compound that has a big, I'm going into a business and I'm thinking I might want to rob this place and there's a monitor there um, with all the cameras mm -hmm. and I can look in that camera and I can't even identify myself. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. What's that telling you? Mm -hmm. I don't need a mask to come in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I have a big, bright, fully digital, latest um, um, IP camera there that can crystal clear identify me, that that I'm not going to tell you I'm not going to rob the place, but I'm going to think a little harder before I'm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So all these security measures, none of them are a 100 percent. You're going to mm -hmm. eradicate the chance of crime, but what they do is they help reduce. Yeah. Crime. The chances. So it's not making yourself the easiest target. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay. What else can we be doing? Um, I mean, uh, again, again, it's communicating. I, we, um, again, as I say, the same things over and over. It's communicating. It's being about proactive. Get to know your neighbors. Speak yeah. to the people in your community. Mm -hmm. um, don't make yourself the easiest target. You know, those are things that you have to be doing on your own. Yeah. Secure your property, make it well lit, all these sort of things. Um, te um, um, technological side. I really like the cameras nowadays. Um, I really like them because I don't have to be home to watch them. I can yeah. watch them on my yeah. phone. Yeah. I can watch them. I can be anywhere in the world as long as mm -hmm. I have access to a computer and, and internet. I can watch my cameras. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so for people coming home at night, again, strongly advise you coming home at night, you're not too sure, pull out your camera, man. Have a quick look what's going on mm -hmm. in, my, in my yard, what's going on in my driving. That's true. Yeah. Um, and once you feel that everything oh. is nice, drive in. If you see yeah. anything out of place, mm -hmm. um, yeah. make a call, make a mm -hmm. report. Mm -hmm. I also add to it, um, um, I'm looking at preparing some safety pamphlets mm -hmm. to issue to the neighbors and, the, and mm -hmm. around us so that they could know more or less what to do, what yeah. not to do, yeah. so that they could also be prepared. Mm -hmm. I like what you said too about the panic buttons. Tell us about that. So if I have like my babysitter at home with a small child or an elderly person at home or someone who lives alone, how does that work? It's, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a little button. You can either be worn on the chain on the wrist wherever mm -hmm. it's convenient for you. And it's, it's simply that, a panic button. When if, if you're at home and, and you're in, in range of the alarm, somebody invades your house and they were able to get in without making mm -hmm. a noise, you press mm -hmm. that button and that's sending a mm -hmm. signal to, to the office, no? to, the, mm -hmm. to the monitoring station. Um, and people are responding, whether it be not just calling the police, but actually dispatching mm -hmm. a mobile unit out to your site as well. Yeah. Um, not kicking down the police, but sometimes when we call them, they can take a little while to respond. You know? yeah. So yeah. Um, companies like uh, Fort Point Security and so forth, we, we, we take the initiative to make sure we respond immediately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you find more people are trying to beef up their security these days? Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. businesses and homes? Business, yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. So clearly mm -hmm. we're all getting the warning here. Yeah, um, you see a lot, you see a lot, lot more um, access controls in businesses. Um, you know, normally you want a welcoming environment, um, you want to be able to walk right into a business, yeah. but nowadays businesses can't take that chance. Mm -hmm. They need to have an access control right at their front door. Mm -hmm. People need to be screened, um, you know, no cups, no glasses and that sort yeah. of stuff. And then mm -hmm. they're let into the compound mm -hmm. or into the business, excuse me. So mm -hmm. people are making changes. Rightfully so though, as you pointed out earlier, we are living in different times. I mean, long gone are the days when you could freely enter a building and the receptionist isn't scared to, to say good morning to you and interact with you on that level. But you find that a lot of times people who do that have ulterior motives, right? And so that no longer can we just allow someone to walk into the business. You have to be screened, you have to be buzzed in. All these measures are taken before you even get inside of an establishment to yeah. transact or what have you. Yeah. Um, here's, a, here's a question though. In terms, we know that from a residential point of view, one needs to safeguard and one needs to take certain measures to protect him or herself and property. From a commercial point of view, where you have business owners 
because that's that's also prevalent as well where you have persons who just barge into a shop or a business and stick up everybody what can they do in so far as being able to secure their perimeter as well again it, a lot of it boils down to access control mm -hmm. um it, it really boils down to uh, being observant yeah um you very very rarely rarely see somebody just randomly wake up this morning start walking down albert street and just immediately walk into a shop and this is the shop i want to rob mm -hmm. these things are, are are tend to be it's a lot of yeah they scout the scout, area he has a watchman yeah. okay this guy has a camera there yeah. okay well but this one here he have nothing it's just some old lady mm -hmm. that's the one we're going for mm -hmm. um so observation access control technology cameras i mean it's you know, I, I, I find that even just moving around and doing business, you know, a, a security guard doesn't make me feel safe. You know, if we look at the recent elderly man that was robbed in Belize City, there, there's a security guard one lot away yeah. um, who walked onto the scene after everything was over. So it seems that people are not, um, again, I go back, the, the traditional measures of security seem to no longer be a... Uh, deterrent for criminals. Um, talk to me about the awareness we can have. You mentioned something earlier about uh, how alert are you when you drive into your home, checking your cameras before you go to your home. What are some of the behaviors that you tell people maybe to look out for that that's a warning sign that something's not right? They're not from the area, that's one thing, but maybe I live in an area where there's a shop so people stop all the time. What are some of the other things that I can look out for? Well, you have to always be on the lookout, you know, because especially that incident will happen on, mm -hmm. on um, Banak, I think Banak Street. Mm -hmm. uh, there is different type of people out there and you don't know, you don't know who is who. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you must always be prepared of your surroundings. So when we find this type of incident happens that because that person is there, like they use the word scout, mm -hmm. they don't know what you already. So that you as an individual, mm -hmm. when you go anywhere, especially a bank or a, or a, or a, um, or a credit union, mm -hmm. that um, coming out of that era, you must be prepared because what happens is that you don't know what you may expect when you, co uh, when you come out of the era. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there is something where we have to look on and, and, and be prepared to ensure either, <laughs> I don't know, I know I use the word run, mm -hmm. but the point is that we must prepare for whatever will happen outside. Yeah. Yeah. Because we don't have the minds that nobody out there who will attack us, who will rob us, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, or want to do any harm to us. So I just think that um, we must always be focused, prepared for what, whatever will happen out there. Because yeah. like what I said, there was a serious situation out there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Serious situation. All right. Any other final tips before we close off? Again, proactive, proactive, proactive. I mean, yeah. you know, not trying to sell for a point, but again, security companies we are offering we certainly offer assessments to come and have a look at your yeah. property mm -hmm. so um, you're not just for security guards or security equipment you can just come in and do a threat assessment yeah, yeah. absolutely okay. we're, we're yeah. a full service security company and okay once it's security private bodyguards mm -hmm. yeah. escorts yeah yeah trained dogs as Train well dogs. yeah all right well, thank you for coming in and reminding us once again all the additional measures that we do have to consider. Uh, I think there's a level of awareness that we have to have, but most importantly, what I've heard from, from your points um, is building that relationship with your neighbors, neighbors once again yep. to kind of have a collective, collective eye on your yeah. sur surroundings. Thank you yep. for coming thank you in. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. We yeah. are going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we'll be talking about biodiversity finance. So please stay tuned.
are back and we're moving into our final conversation for today as we find out more about phase two of Biofin. What that means, we're going to find out right now. We have with us on set Hannah St. Luce Martinez, uh, who is a representative from Biofin. We have Christopher Magan, who also a representative from Biofin, and the executive director for PAC, Nayari Diaz Perez. Good morning. Good morning. And Good morning. welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And so when we say biofin, we mean biodiversity finance. Let's, let's get that bit of information out. Um, but we're moving into the second phase. And so it's a great time to look back and see where this all started mm -hmm. and what the goals were. Who wants to kick things off? Um, I'll volunteer. Mm -hmm. Yes. So if you remember in 2016, I believe, mm -hmm. I came mm -hmm. here and I yes. sat and I spoke with you of the biodiversity finance initiative mm -hmm. um, the overall aim of the biodiversity finance initiative was the development of a s sustainable finance plan yeah. mm -hmm. for biodiversity management in belize yes. um, biofin as i mentioned the last time is a global initiative in approximately 35 countries um, biofin was uh, or is a result of the 10th conference of the party of the Convention on Biological Diversity mm -hmm. when an assessment showed that most countries were behind in the implementation of national biodiversity strategies and action plan. Mm -hmm. um, NBSAP, as we refer to them, is uh, uh, the roadmap for biodiversity management at national mm -hmm. levels. Mm -hmm. So for Belize, for example, our NBSAP contains 20 biodiversity targets. Um, but biodiversity management is not cheap. It comes with a cost. Mm -hmm. um, same way running our homes isn't cheap. Running biodiversity as the national le at the national level is not cheap. Um, and so the assessment showed that most countries were behind in terms of biodiversity management because they had no biodiversity finance plans. How will I implement those strategies and those actions that I have outlined within my strategies? Mm -hmm. Most countries were, were unclear as to how they would proceed in, in the implementation of those strategies. Yeah. Um, and so Biofin started off in 2010 in approximately 20, country and 20 countries and then it expanded. Belize, Cuba, um, were, and Brazil were, uh, the cohort of the, the last countries to join on to mm -hmm. Biofin at that time. And so Biofin came about to assist us in implementing um, that our NBSAP via the development of our biodiversity finance plan. Mm -hmm. So in phase one of Biofin, what we conducted were a bit of uh, a few assessments which led to the development of the finance plan. One of the first assessments was the, we conducted a policy and institutional review mm -hmm. where we assessed enabling conditions mm -hmm. and barriers for achieving financial sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, we carried out an expenditure review. We looked at our expenditures, biodiversity related expenditures over a five year period running from 2012 to 2017. Yeah. We also costed our NBSAPs, our NBSAP, which most countries prior to Biofin had limited funding or capacity to, to do. Yeah. Um, and so we funded, uh, we, we costed our, NB, our NBSAP. And then we developed our biodiversity finance plan, yeah. having assessed what we were spending, having assessed the cost to implement mm -hmm. our NBSAP, yeah. and having analyzed the, the political, legislative, and in institutional um, platforms um, for biodiversity financing in Belize. And based on phase one, where you, you in, in simplest terms, did kind of an analysis of what things cost, what we were spending, whether they were spent the right way or sustainable. Where were we seeing the greatest drain on resources or the greatest investment in, res in resources? Right. So what we assessed was that the, the, the greatest drain of investment was on public awareness Mm. and, and um, development planning. Mm -hmm. So we realized we had a lot of, we were spending a lot of funds on development of glossy documents, which mm. outlined strategies, mm -hmm. but limited funding was being spent on the implementation Fish. of those strategies. Yeah. So um, the case. Yes, we also had um, a lot of investment going in public awareness. We're going to schools, we're going, uh, open your, oh, we're going on open your eyes, um, we're doing symposiums. But was that translating into direct impact on yeah. the ground? No. So the areas where we had most funding spent 
was on um, communication, public mm -hmm. awareness, and development planning in the form of strategic documents and plans for yeah. the sector. Mm -hmm. And looking at areas perhaps that uh, <coughs> were lacking in resources, what were some of those identified areas? The areas would be protection, mm -hmm. um, and uh, which involves enforcement, and the other is on um, benefit sharing and sustainable use, yeah. which are some of the areas where we need to, if there is sustainable use, there is ownership, there is stewardship, is there is protection, there is proper management, there is enforcement of the activities, enforcement of legislation, of regulation on the ground. So we realize we need to kind of step up as it relates to protection of the resources yeah. and also um, sharing of benefits. Um, biodiversity is not just about the conservation field, it's about the private sector, mm -hmm. it's about hydrology, yeah. um, it's about energy, it's tourism, it's agriculture. Was it just government agencies that was involved in this assessment? Uh, no. All environmental? No. Um, and that's why we have invited yeah. as well the Protected Areas Conservation Trust as a partner mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in the implementation of Biofin. Um, you have the Ministry of Economic Development. Mm -hmm. We worked closely with the Ministry of Tourism, um, Finance, the Development Foundation Cooperation. Um, we have multiple partners. As I also always mention, biodiversity touches all our lives. Mm -hmm. It is not just the conservation field. Yeah. The air that we breathe, the water that we drink, all um, has that biodiversity um, theme. So what specific role does PACT play in this broader context? Well, if you're familiar with the Protected Areas Conservation Trust, mm -hmm. we are the National Trust Fund mm -hmm. for uh, protected areas financing in Belize um, and as you may very well know protected areas house the largest number of biodiversity species mm -hmm. that we have and so we utilize the Belize National Protected Area System as the management tool for managing biodiversity in Belize. So PACT as the um, premier financing source or as the national source for uh, conservation and protected areas financing in Belize really has a large role to play in terms of um, ensuring the proper use of the investments um, yeah. that are made in biodiversity as well as using the, the funds that we do have available uh, to leverage additional resources, not necessarily just financial, yeah. or, but um, additional resources for the sustainable management of biodiversity in the country. Mm -hmm. And moving into phase two, so we've done all the data, well, we've <laughs> done the analysis to see, okay, here's where people, it's like taking a stock of your budget, you exactly. know, this is what I've been spending on, this is where the most money has been going, this is where I've always needed more money, um, and so you've taken a stock of all of that, and phase two now is more effectively using the finances that exist. So what will that entail? Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> um, so phase two... Um, first of all, we estimated the cost of implementation of our NBSAP. Um, mm -hmm. We estimate over a 10-year period it will cost about $70 million release dollars or $7 million a year to mm -hmm. implement the NBSAP as it currently stands. Mm -hmm. um, Biofin focuses on looking at where you're spending currently and seeing mm -hmm. how we can spend less, um, realign the expenditures, yeah. or generate new revenue streams. Um, as Hannah mentioned, there, is, there are funds being spent currently, but is it targeted towards the, the, the sort of best use? A lot of these funds come from donors, so one of the final solutions we're looking at is our grants, mm -hmm. um, looking at who we're seeking grants from mm -hmm. and ensuring that they're actually aligned with achieving the NBSAP targets, the goals and objectives. Um, one of the assessments that we did is looking at developing a tracking tool for biodiversity. Mm -hmm. um, as with most research in Belize, data is always an issue. It's, it's always a recurring theme that we yeah. have challenges mm -hmm. with data. So we developed a biodiversity expenditure tracking tool that's currently being rolled out in the ministry mm -hmm. with, um, of forestry, fisheries, environment, sustainable development. <laughs> and we're looking to actually roll it out across other ministries in the government and possibly in the NGO sector as well. Um, we think that will yield a lot of dividends looking at where the money is spent yeah. and, and how we can better spend. You know what I find interesting? In your costing exercise, where do you put priorities? Because the, 
As we know, with uh, managing natural resources, there are multiple ways that you can benefit. By preserving, sometimes you can generate an income, um, and, and sometimes you can export it. You can use it as a tourist product, which, which generates its own income as well. I'm reflecting on a conversation we had recently with FCD, mm -hmm. and they were doing a kind of a, a very similar exercise of saying, what is it costing us to do this? And this was specifically looking at saving the macaws. Um, and so what they're noticing is they're spending so much money, human resource, and time saving individual birds, which is what they want and continue to need to do, um, but it's, it's very cost prohibitive. And so if we think of this from a, a public perspective, we also know that FCD plays a very critical role in maintaining the border and in keeping us updated there. So where should the money go? And the chicken bull is so fast and the resources are so limited. Where should the money be going? How do we decide what the priority areas are and where it's best invested? So even within the NBSAP, yeah. mm -hmm. there were about 20 targets. Um, what we did, we conducted a prioritization workshop with various stakeholders, yeah. NGO, government, some private sector, and we looked at what are the priorities. Some of the priorities have to focus on implementation. Um, as we noted from the assessment, implementation mm -hmm. is key. Some of it has to do with monitoring and evaluation of the overall spend. Um, as I said, understanding where the funds are going, like putting resources into understanding where your funds are going will um, inevitably yield better results. It's like if you're trying to lose weight, if you don't have a scale, you're, you're kind of mm -hmm, guessing yeah. there, right? Um, key ecosystems, ensuring that we protect and sustainably manage and sustainably use key ecosystems that provide ecosystem services like clean air, water they help with the pillars of our economy like tourism and agriculture mm -hmm. so yeah. those are some of the priority areas that we're focusing on yeah mm -hmm. and i must say even um packed in 2018 when it rolled out it um conservation, conservation investment, investment strategy, strategy mm -hmm. um did so recognizing that there are areas that are in need of urgent intervention or urgent yeah. um, activities to to reduce impact on, on biodiversity. Mm -hmm. So PACT, for example, has made biodiversity targets part of, of, priorities. of their priorities. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so you will have PACT, for example, investing not just in areas um, within protected areas, but in areas where there is pri where that are considered priority. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the Chiki Bowl, for example, at the national mm -hmm. level is considered a key biodiversity area. Yeah. Um, not only because of the extent of land within the Maya Mountain Massif, as we tend to call it, mm -hmm. but because of the, 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 the concentrated amount of biodiversity that you have in there. Yeah. And even beyond the biodiversity, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the Chiki Bowl, the, the Maya Mountain Massif, plays a, a very important role as it relates to watershed yeah. management. Um, maintaining genetic resources that you mm -hmm. have within those areas, besides the whole um, transborder, um, transboundary yeah. issues, but yeah. the, the Chiki Bowl has been recognized as a key biodiversity areas. Um, and so I can, I'm probably speaking on behalf of PAC, but I know definitely that <laughs> PAC, for example, as our main financing vehicle, yeah. mm -hmm. has been working along with the mm -hmm. Friends for Conservation and Development, which is one of our partners within the Massif. Yeah. Yeah. And it's important to note also that um, in the management of protected areas, we can't, um, we can't take a site-based approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, while each individual site is going to have its own challenges, um, for example, PAC as a National Trust Fund, we have to look at it from a system, system. level yeah. approach. And so we are looking, um, as Hannah mentioned in 2018, when we prioritized our conservation investment strategy, we looked at identifying critical ecosystems that would be priority within the broader system for us to invest in, but not just uh, the, the ecosystems themselves, but the priority actions that yeah. we have to, the priority interventions that we have to finance yeah. within those ecosystems to make sure that the impact at the system level um, is what we're, is yeah. what we're after. Last week, the uh, PAC signed, uh, gave money to the fisheries at 1.5 million. Yes. And I think one of the first things people said is, wow, that's a that's lot. A lot of <laughs> um, and it fits into what's happening here. So you will be looking at larger investments 
where there'll be a broader impact. impact. One of one of the the founding uh, pillars mm -hmm. of the approach we took in updating our conservation investment strategy is that we moved away from what PAC traditionally had done um, as project-based financing, yeah. and now we're moving to funding of programs across mm -hmm. the system. Yeah. And so the Fisheries Department grant that you heard about um, last week is actually the tenth of ten um, investment programs that we um, embarked on yeah. since 2018. And what we uh, are doing with that is that we're now taking a results-based approach. Yeah. That conservation investment strategy is based on a consultative and long-term planning process. Mm -hmm. And so the priorities that were identified are evidence-based. They're based yeah. on data collected in the field. And they're also focused on particular targets with specific indicators for us to measure. So we have identified a number of conservation return on those mm -hmm. investments. And so that is what we're going to be focusing, one of which is biodiversity conservation yeah. and management. I was going to ask, well, what, what is the return? We talk returns in finance, it's <laughs> one, it's because <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> Chris <laughs> laughs. Exactly. So when, when Chris talks about it, he talks about it more from the finance yeah. perspective. Yeah. But for us, our mandate is to focus on those conservation returns and those investments. Because yeah. PACT has been around for 23 years yeah. now. Mm -hmm. And one of our challenges has always been to demonstrate the impact of the investments we have been making. Mm -hmm. Over that period of time, we've invested over 33 million Belize dollars in protected areas management. Mm -hmm. Do we clearly have something to show for it? Mm -hmm. It's a whole other discussion. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But that is what we have been trying to improve over the years. So this particular strategy that we have is a three-year strategy um, that identifies particular targets. And we also it also comes with indicators to measure progress towards those mm -hmm. targets. So we've identified those individual conservation returns that we're expecting from this $9 million total investment that we're going to be making. Yeah. When you say you have identified three targets, mm -hmm. uh, what is the most important of those three? Is it based on a priority scale as well? or We didn't prioritize it to that level mm -hmm. because all three of them are at least um, for the most part equally important if you're looking at uh, protection of biodiversity in general terms. Mm -hmm. Biodiversity conservation and management is one that will see the largest investment simply because one of the, the key areas that we're looking at is enforcement um, and sustaining the integrity of those ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And so that in itself uh, requires the largest investment simply because it is costly. <laughs> when you're talking about enforcement in the marine area, for mm -hmm. example, you're talking about fuel and mm -hmm. lubricant and everything that goes into you know getting an enforcement vessel out there it's really costly yeah. yeah but we also have the other two complementary targets which are the socio-economic benefits and looking at the communities and the benefits to communities around those protected areas the communities that depend um, and influence mm -hmm. how successful you are in the management of a protected area and mm -hmm. then also looking at financial sustainability and income generation as you mm -hmm. pointed out earlier some of these areas have a lot of potential, yeah. but there are also some other areas that strictly because on the reason for their existence as a protected area, their designation, they cannot generate any income. Mm -hmm. yeah. But those are some of the areas that need a lot of investment because they're biodiversity hotspots. Mm -hmm. An area like the Chiki Bull, it's vast, it's the largest terrestrial protected area that we have mm -hmm. as part of the system. It requires a lot of money to manage that area. Mm -hmm. However, it's not an area that can easily generate revenues. Yeah especially from things like tourism or other mm. things like that. And so we have to look at financial sustainability and income generation at the global scale, at the system level, um, mm -hmm. at the national level. And so that is where PAC's role becomes important because all the money we generate is not going to be sufficient yeah. to fill that financial gap. And so one of our focus as well um, going forward is strategic partnerships and how do we ensure that we're using tax resources to leverage additional support, mm -hmm. not just financial, but in other firms and forms such as uh, technical support or program mm -hmm. support from other partners and donors with an interest in ensuring um, the integrity of these ecosystems. One of the partners that we um, have always had challenges in engaging but want to pursue more aggressively is partnership with the private sector and, and getting them engaged um, to support Mm -hmm. the, the protection of our biodiversity because they benefit from it as yeah. well. 
But some areas have been able to find that delicate balance between generating funds and also doing pr preservation of, of the area that they manage. I think Yashe is a great example with some of the, the areas they've used. But there are also other, uh, I think globally, it ways uh, that biodiversity can earn money. And I've always wondered why we don't tap into them. Carbon credits is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, that has been, and I think, for as long as I've been doing the show, we've been talking about carbon <laughs> credits. Um, and so where we see other countries are moving towards creating more greenery. They're planting more trees. They're seeing long term, we need something to suck all the filth out of the air yeah. that the rest of the world is concerned about. We haven't been on that path. Is, is that something we will see more in the immediate future? Well, I, I'm not sure if you're aware, but we have the Red Plus, Red Plus program yep. that's happening within the ministry. Indeed. And one of the key objectives of that program is basically to get buildings ready mm -hmm. for implementing a Red Plus program. Um, and that is something that would advance our work on that front because mm -hmm. we have, that is focused on um, generating revenues from reducing deforestation. Yeah. And so um, once, and, and that is a three-year program that we're implementing, and I say we because part, part is a part of the yeah. consortium, yeah. Um, but we're implementing that program that we're hoping that within the next two years or by the end of next year, we'll be in a much better position to have identified a lot of that uh, information and data that we need mm -hmm. um, to be able to define the strategies that we're going to employ going forward. So. Okay. It is something we're aware of. It is something that is a long-term um, strategy, yeah. but we have to get the country ready to be able to participate at that global level. Yeah. Um, it, it also requires a, a cultural change in how we, um, how we approach protected areas management or biodiversity <coughs> management. Um, for example, in the past, we, 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 it was felt that passion alone was enough to get <laughs> us beyond that point and and or just love of nature and yeah. no we realize we really and truly That's need to take on that okay. business approach to yeah. protected yeah. areas management not just business approach as in to uh, as it relates to the investment needed to manage the resources but the returns you should yeah. get from that yeah. investment made yeah. into the resources yeah. um, and so biofin has recognized that as well and so one of the finance solutions that we're looking to implement is to actually carry out a feasibility assessment mm -hmm. um, of whether the establishment of business models for protected areas is actually a good way of taking us into the future as it relates to getting returns from that investment we make in, in protected areas. Yeah. Um, and so we're hoping to pilot it within the corridors um, because the, pi the, the corridors um, bring to the forefront the, the multiple tenure situation that you have in corridor the multiple land use um, scenarios that you have um, but it also brings to the forefront the, the fact that we need to take on the business approach to protected areas yeah. um, exploring the different services that our protected areas um, provide not just timber you you have tourism you have watershed you have sustainable agricultural practices that in many countries are actually um, promoted within reserves mm -hmm. Um, it's not always what you do, but how you do it. So what are some of the other untapped potential that we have to generate revenue from a biodiversity that perhaps we haven't been accessing? I think the first, start, the first thought is always tourism. Mm -hmm. But right. what, what else have we missed? Um, some of the solutions we're actually looking at. Um, so we start from the simple looking at our grants, ensuring that we're getting mm -hmm. the grants that are actually matching up with our strategy. Mm -hmm. Another interesting solution we're looking at is, can we use something like crowdfunding to, mm -hmm. to tap into local and international interests in yeah. investing in biodiversity and partnering with an entity like PAC2 has experience in administering the disbursement of grant funds mm -hmm. and, and providing that sort of tracking um, as I mentioned, the tracking tools so that we can monitor where our expenditure is going. And there's also some interesting stuff. One of the solutions we're looking at is the carbon market and accessing the carbon mm -hmm. credits. Along. So we're working with programs like the Red Plus and, and, and we're going to investigate that a bit further to see if we can actually get traction. Yeah. But initially, the focus is on let's look at the grants, let's look at um, possibly the carbon um, not the carbon credits, the, the crowdfunding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And another thing that we're trying to do is set up a biodiversity office 
um, mm. within the ministry to look at uh, managing the implementation of the NBSAP so that some of those funds go towards coordination of the NBSAP implementation. Interesting. And when you say m monitor the grants, is it because we still have a process? Uh, we always say sometimes in the NGO culture that we chase the funds <laughs> rather than fulfill the objectives. Is that what's happening when you yeah. talk about paying yeah. attention to grants? Right, right. Mm -hmm. I think I think that's very. You kind of hit the nail on the head okay. there. Mm -hmm. We have to look at um, why we're taking on this grant. What's the level of effort to obtain? What's the level of effort to manage? And is it aligned with our strategic objectives and mm -hmm. priorities? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, what is the timeline for the rollout of phase two of Biofin and, and what can we expect uh, when this phase is over? Um, phase one ran for a period of three years, mm -hmm. 2016 to 2018. Phase two will take us from 2019 into 2023. Mm -hmm. um, it's a longer phase, Thank longer you. period, time frame for phase two. Um, but the phase two should see us at the end, having um, with the implementation of the, 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 the finance solutions that we mentioned. Yeah. Belize should be in a better place financing wise yeah. at the end of 2023. Um, the establishment of a crowd, cloud, um, crowdfunding platform for us would be a big plus if yeah. we get that accomplished. Um, the establishment of a biodiversity unit, as I mentioned, we've been spending a lot on, on strategic or planning documents, yeah. and we rarely implement those. Um, the, the they look pretty and colorful on the shelf. Really <laughs> glossy, <laughs> really pretty. We put some nice background <laughs> photos. Yeah. Um, but the problem with that is when there isn't a champion, mm. they tend to go through the crack. Yeah. And yeah. why? Because as soon as a new grant com comes along, we forget that one and we move on to the, to the, to the money that's yeah. at hand, right? And so yeah. having a champion for... Um, biodiversity management if we get that done by 2023 again that will push us into the future um, and into the, the, the CBD at the, at the global level 2020 mm. and beyond um, um, strategic plan as well so you know I may be guilty of exactly what we're talking about chasing grants and I'll chase <laughs> a common topic because uh, it is trending at this time, even though we've been talking about it a long time. How do we factor in things like climate change when we look at the long-term planning? You know, we knew we'd be affected. Look at the droughts we've faced this year. We're seeing even some of the health implications with changing cycles of the mosquito for dengue. How do you factor that in into the next uh, cycle or the f next phase, um, understanding there's still some aspects that we may not know uh, might impact us in some way? Well, um, I think we have recognized the whole issue of climate change from early on. As mm -hmm. practitioners, the as yeah. practitioners yeah. in the field, yeah. we have been seeing the impacts um, climate change has had on biodiversity for some time. Yeah. And so some years back, we have actually started to mainstream climate change considerations into management planning for protected areas. So mm -hmm. for instance, um, we've been updating the management planning framework, which is a framework that guides how you develop management plans for these areas. And these are five-year plans that take into account all of that. Um, we introduced climate change into those. And for instance, all the ones that PAC has funded for um, different sites across the system have in their um, specific strategies to deal with climate change and building the climate change resilience of these protected areas. Yeah. Um, as far back as 2015 also, for instance, um, with the government's support, PAC sought accreditation from the Global Climate Funds, the mm -hmm. Green Climate Fun Fund and the Adaptation Fund, which are the largest two uh, climate funds globally, for us to be able to tap into those resources. Um, directly without having to go through the multilaterals which we know is a whole yeah. other process um, for us to be able to develop uh, strategies um, to access those funds yeah. on behalf of the country so that we target some of the more urgent and pressing climate change issues um, since we've been able to navigate those process successfully PACT is now an accredited direct access entity and so we are already now in process of developing large programs um, for us to deal with some of the issues that are affecting biodiversity management, mm -hmm. um, you may be aware that we have also partnered with other donors, international donors, on addressing something like the erosion issue mm -hmm. that we're seeing that's quite urgent and threatening mm -hmm. um, not just 
biodiversity and, and conservation targets, but also threatening livelihoods of our yeah. communities, yeah. especially in the south. And so we've been doing work on that. And as the years go by, we're hoping that um, with the support of all the partners, government and the NGO community, we're going to be able to design um, programs that are going to address some of the most critical issues. Because climate change is an ever-changing issue. Yes. Everything is something new, and when you're trying to tackle one, there's already something another new. issue coming up. Yeah. So it, it is going to be a challenge to keep up mm -hmm. with the pace at which, it, at which the issues are changing. Um, however, I think uh, we've made a start, and I think that is important. Well, thank you for coming in and providing an update for us uh, on phase two of this program. We appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Thank you. For that. All right. We'll get check-ins too, I hope, right? Yes. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and take that final break now. And when we come back, we'll have our wrap-up. So stay tuned. Quite an interesting show from yeah. mosquitoes to, <laughs> to, security. to security to biodiversity. Yeah, yeah. All very important topics. Mm -hmm. I think I really walked away um, feeling that, that uh, there's some very critical issues that the public needed to know. We hope we've helped yeah. you to understand a bit more. Um, definitely encourage you to take precaution when it comes to dengue, wear repellent, clean up your area, um, and uh, ensure that if you do have uh, signs of dengue, the fever, the achy feeling, go to the clinic, go to a doctor and get checked out. This is of course just to ensure that you're not going to develop the severe form of dengue which can leave you hospitalized and uh, even potentially kill you. So um, keep that in mind. Remember the vulnerable populations, we're talking about the elderly persons, we're talking about children in, in Honduras for example. Mm -hmm. I really found that shocking that the majority of deaths 
associated with dengue has been in children. Um, so clearly once it impacts them, it, it did, their health deteriorates very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, you also want to consider the fact if you have diabetes, if you have hypertension, if you have other illnesses or conditions that you manage, um, that makes you even more prone in getting severe forms of dengue. And if you've had it before um, as well, that's another one of the vulnerable um, vulnerabilities you may have. And of course, we would like to take the opportunity to remind or advise viewers of protecting themselves and protecting their homes, given the spate yeah. of burglaries and home invasions that have been happening across the country recently. Yeah. I know that um, advice was given from one particular company, but the onus is on you to be able to protect yourself, protect your loved ones, and protect your properties. Absolutely. And uh, we also want to thank the representatives from PACT and Biofin for coming in and talking about what is going to be the launch of their phase two of their project. Very interesting initiative there and some of the information that they brought in terms of looking at where we're spending our money, where we need to spend our money, how we're going to spend our money when it comes to biodiversity. Very critical because we know how much we rely on the fact that Belize is so rich in biodiversity. Um, not only for just what we're proud of for living here, but also as what we market ourselves uh, as internationally as well. All right, so that's all the time we have for today. Remember, if you want to contact us, send us an email at oye at channel5belize.com. Drop me a line at marleni underscore oye at channel5belize.com. Find us on Facebook at Open Your Eyes BZ and on Instagram at OYE Belize. And remember to tune in tomorrow morning at 6.30 when you open your eyes. Start your morning right. Until then, keep your eyes, your mind, and your hearts open. We'll see you soon. Enjoy your day, believe. Goodbye. Open Your Eyes was brought to you by the Belize Bank, our country, your bank, and SMART, bringing people together.